Dio Guardi is a Grammy-nominated songwriter and record executive whose hit songs have appeared on albums by the likes of Celine Dion, Britney Spears, and Christina Aguilera. But she's perhaps best known for her polarizing stint as the fourth judge on American Idol. Take a look. Only thing I wish is a little bit lighter, playful. That's the only thing. You get very serious, but the vocal was fire. Oh, it really was. <laughs> Well, he has a way with the ladies, doesn't oh, he? Oh, yeah. Um, Cara dishes about all the backstage drama on the show and a lot more in her new book, A Hell of a High Note, Surviving Life, Love, and American Idol. And with me now is the very talented Miss Cara Dioguardi. <laughs> So good to see you. You know, yeah, yes, good to see you too. But you know, when I watch that, he's annoying, Simon. <laughs> but he also was the reason I would watch the show. Of course, of course. And I, right now, I don't know, how do you feel about the show right now? I haven't seen it that much, but what I have seen, it looks like they're having fun. Um, I'm a big Steven Tyler fan. I actually his music or his obsession uh, with young women? Uh, his music? <laughs> I don't know about his obsession with young well, women. Well, he's always flirting with all the girls he's that come on. He's a rock star, man. Rock stars, that's like what they, you know, that's I guess. their thing. But about a year ago, I got a call from a friend of mine who said, Marty Fredrickson, who said, I'm going to come over right now so we can write a song. I'm with Steven Tyler. And I was like, what? You're bringing St Steven Tyler to my house right now? I'm like throwing on makeup. I'm like, what I got to eat, you know, yeah. bringing down the Yamaha keyboard. And Steven <laughs> Tyler get, walks into my house and I'm just like, you know, yeah. dying. Yeah. Because he was a hero of mine. And he starts playing Dream On and we write this song together. And I, wow. I said to myself, this is a guy who would be a great replacement. And I actually called the producer. So oh. I think he's great. I mean, he brings a lot of life to the show. And they look like they're having a good time. Well, yeah, they look like they're having a good time. I don't, I'm not a music person. I yeah. don't know from music. I only know what I like to listen to. So without somebody there with a real critical eye, I can't tell if the person's really good or not. They all sound the same to me. Well, I think as, as artists, it's probably also harder to kind of judge other artists because you're, you're in the same yeah. boat in the same way well, that someone would be judging you. But maybe that's why Simon and you and Randy were right for the, for the, for the situation. Well, I, I can't speak for the, the current judges, but I know for me that how I got better in my career was when people were really critical and they told me what I wasn't doing. Mm -hmm. Because in the music business, it's so competitive and you have to write so many songs and go through so much crap to get yeah. where you are. Yeah. That that pushed me and I got better. And actually on American Idol, you know, season eight was really difficult for me and I talk about that in the book. I was someone who came from behind the scenes. I'd never been on television. I didn't even know where the cameras were. Right. I, I mean, it was a nightmare. Did anybody help you? Not really. No. And that's where the reality TV comes in. But by doing it and keeping it going and listening to feedback, actually talking to people like Simon, you know, I'd say, Simon, what am I not doing? You know, and he'd be like, stop being so serious. I thought it was a music show, but it was a TV show. Right. I needed to be more entertaining, but I, I couldn't find my role because really my role was an industry expert. Mm -hmm. And when have you seen ex experts be really entertaining? You came in when basically there was Paul and Randy and Simon there. Yeah. Now they throw a fourth judge in there. And I was reading that you really didn't feel comfortable and the audience didn't seem to take to that idea. But you were there for two seasons. I was there for two seasons. I don't think people really understood what I did. And, and you know, in my book, you know, Hell of a High Note deals with my backstory, that I was a songwriter, that I spent years trying to hone my craft and being rejected and then finally becoming a successful songwriter and record executive and publisher. And there was no backstory. It was like they just pulled some girl off the street and, mm -hmm. you know, who looked kind of like Paul Abdul, who was supposed to take over Paul Abdul. So that set up wasn't exactly no, because, a great one. because Paula was popular. Of course, Paula was great. She was the heart. And I I was never trying to take anyone down. I was just trying to do my job and trying to figure out. You know something, how that is a it. bad position to be in. I remember when Deborah Norville took over for Jane Pauley yeah. on onto the Today Show. And everybody hated Deborah Norville. And she she's a nice person, and so she is, is of course is Jane. But she couldn't really shake that. It's really difficult it's to nice. break up the mm -hmm. Beatles. And, you know, but I have to say, through it all, I'm so glad I did American Idol. It, I faced every fear I ever had, stage fright, and I, I came through it, and I'm stronger and better for it, so I have nothing bad to no, say about the show. Of course. It was more, it was really difficult to go from the studio behind the scenes to like, oh my God, what side do I, I mean, I remember the first time I got an autograph. Do I sign on my boobs? Do I sign on my face? What do I, I didn't even know what to do. So it was, getting used to it. What know? about Paula and Simon? 
Did they get along with each they other? They did. They did. You know, I, I think that they had a really good chemistry. They, she was the heart of the show, meaning she gave people second, third, fourth chances. Oh, and I, I know. think America loved that That's about her. That's what Jennifer Lopez does too, doesn't she? She's also very easy on everybody. Uh, well, and I think that there are two sides to the story. It's some people think you need to nurture artists, yeah. and some people feel that that nurturing comes from a critical mm. stance. Um, so you kind of had them both battling it out. And we were really hurt in season nine when Paula left because Paula was a yes vote on the audition. She also was a train wreck. <laughs> I don't know if she was a train wreck, but she was. I mean, everybody. She was loopy half the time, and people thought she, she was, was fun. Though, and she, she got, was, you know, she, she got caught up in the moment, which you know, <laughs> I, I wish I could have gotten more caught up in the moment. I was kind of caught up in the, oh my God, get this camera off me and get it onto Paula. Yeah, you know, I was like, it's very nice, Paula. What do you think? Like, I just wanted it off me. I get know, off. But, but people just thought that she was drinking and doing drugs. Was she? she? I never saw her do. You know, and I lived well, in her house. Yeah. I mean, when I first met her, mm -hmm. I never saw her. Touch a drug. I never saw her smoke a cigarette mm -hmm. or even drink. Right. So I mean, I know she's talked about prescription pills mm -hmm. in the past, but I can't, you know, speak about that. But what I can say is, we were hurt in season nine that she wasn't there, and I feel like at the end of the day, they should have paid her what she wanted. Okay. Well, I agree with that. Yeah. They could have used, uh, kept her there. Yeah. Um, but then you know, the businesses can be cruel. Very yes. cruel. Did you quit or did they fire you? What's the story there? So. When I um, woke up on the I was summer vacation at Costa Maine, and after Ellen had left, the next morning I woke up to reports that I'd been fired. Yeah. And it was like, you know, somebody shot me or something. It was that feeling of fired. I've never been fired in my life. It kind yeah. of brought back every rejection, you know, when I got my heart broken by a boy or whatever. And I called the producers and I said, I'm reading reports that I've been fired. Have I been fired? Yeah. And they said, no. And I said, well, what is this coming from? What, why would it be on the internet? And they said, well, Ellen leaving has really upset the whole panel. We were looking for a replacement for Simon, and now we have to look for two replacements. So things are up in the air. Uh -huh. And I said, so are you telling me that I may or may not be on the show? And they said, it's, you know, it's uncertain. You may be on it, you may not be. It's like 50, 50, 60, 40. Yeah. And at that time, I felt like I'd pushed back my schedule already twice. I had three other jobs. I, I couldn't keep my life on hold. And I've always been somebody who controls their own destiny. Uh -huh. and it was just time to leave. So I sent a letter. So my you, manager you sent a quit. letter. Yeah. And said, okay. please release me from my contract. All right. but, you know, your book is filled with all sorts of things sexual abuse, eating disorders, uh, date rape. I want to talk about some of that yeah. when we come back. So stay right there. HLN Friday night at 7 and 10 Eastern. I'm back with songwriter and former American Idol judge Cara Diaguardi. Now, you write in the book how when you were 11 years old, you were repeatedly molested by um, an older guy. How old was he? And you were 11. He was what? He's about 18. 18. Well, that's, that's 18. an adult. 18. Uh, you know, um, you say he was the teenage son of a family friend in the book. He sounds like he's really an adult. A 18 yeah. votes. 18 goes into, to war. I think he was going. It happened in college and when he was going in. Yeah. Tell me what happened. Well, he was, uh, we used to play, you know, Monster, it was called. And one day, or Hide and Seek kind of thing, where you'd run around and hide. And one day, it kind of turned into, what I say in mm -hmm. Hell of a High Note, is Hide, Seek, and Touch. And you don't really know what's going on at that age. You're right. kind of like, whoa, hold on, what, mm -hmm. what is this? And I, I did speak to my mother about it, and unfortunately, it was a time when I think there were no Oprahs. It was still kind of repressed in, uh -huh. in the culture about speaking about these mm -hmm. things. And she was... What year was this? Do you um, remember? Well, it was probably 81. 1981? Yeah. Uh -huh. So it was something that she really couldn't handle. Uh -huh. And I think as a kid, you process that as, I'm not good enough, or something's wrong with me. But, you know, the good news is that before she died, we spoke about it. And since I've written the book, her friends have called me and said this was something that weighed on her, you know, in her life. She probably just was not capable of dealing with it. She was not capable of dealing with it. But it did What about your father? Where was he? He, he didn't... I didn't discuss this with You her. just went to your mother. Yeah. It's not that she didn't believe you. She just didn't do anything She didn't know what it. to do. She did not...